So I just want to welcome everyone to today's Green Business Fund technical webinar, Moving to an Electric Vehicle Fleet. So now I'm going to give it over to our presenter, Jamie Clark, and he will start this presentation. Perfect. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Um, as Susan said, the focus is on moving to an electric vehicle fleet, and this webinar is being presented by the Green Business Fund. Um, just a quick introduction to myself. My name's, as I said, Jamie Clark. I'm an associate here at the Carbon Trust and one of our uh, experts in sustainable fleets. Um, I'm an ESOS fleet assessor, so I have plenty of hands-on experience with auditing various fleets of different vehicles for a lot of our customers. Um, and for the Carbon Trust itself, some of you may be very familiar with what we do, but for, for others, um, the Carbon Trust is an independent, mission-driven organisation that works globally with businesses and governments, and our mission is to accelerate the move to a sustainable, low-carbon economy. Um, of course, we see you know, low emission vehicles as a key part to achieving this, especially in the UK, um, hence the delivery of this webinar. So quickly, just to run you through the agenda for today, um, I expect it will probably take around 45 minutes or so with time at the end for any questions. Uh, to start with, we'll just kind of set a bit of a bit of scene, give some context as to why electric vehicles you know, are such a hot topic right now, why they're growing in the UK. Following that, we'll then start to look a bit about whether electric vehicles are actually suitable for your business. Um, we appreciate that businesses have all kinds of different fleets and there's no real kind of one, one solution fits all uh, for, for fleets. Uh, you know, the operations are very different between businesses, but hopefully this webinar will be at a high level, but also relevant enough across a range of different EV categories so that there is useful information for all kinds of different businesses. And to support that, the next section will then be on presenting the business case for electric vehicles. Um, that can usually be quite a, you know, quite a difficult bit of transitioning to electric vehicles, uh, convincing perhaps finance of the uh, economical and environmental benefits of switching to electric vehicles. We've also got a couple of case studies and examples of businesses switching to EV fleets, just to give you that real life example. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, this webinar is being provided by the Green Business Fund. So we will talk a little bit about how the Green Business Fund can support move to electric vehicles and introduce some of the services that are available to SMEs through the Green Business Fund. As I mentioned there, uh, the Green Business Fund is aimed at SMEs. So the content of this webinar is mostly focused at SMEs, but as I said, there should be hopefully a lot of information for all, all businesses. So to kick off and set the scene a little bit, uh, I think we'll just start at a very high level and just ensure we all know what we're talking about when we talk about electric vehicles. So there are plenty of alternative, alternative fuel vehicles available. Um, we are focusing on these four main categories of electric vehicles. We have starting at the left, um, pure electric vehicles or battery electric vehicles, BEV. Um, there may well be a number of acronyms throughout this webinar, so um, I'll try and keep them as few as possible. So the BVs are wholly electric drivetrain vehicles. These are cars you uh, plug in, charge them, and then the battery powers the car uh, for the entire entirety of the battery. Um, the next one along is plug-in hybrid EVs or PHEVs. Um, model picture there is a Mitsubishi Outlander, which is very popular at the moment. And this utilizes an electric battery for slow speed driving, but then also has an internal combustion engine, which powers the drivetrain for longer journeys, or it's a combination of both the battery motor and the IC at the same time to improve efficiency. The third category is the extended range EVs. Uh, this is similar to the wholly electric vehicle, but it does have um, an internal combustion engine which acts as a generator just to provide a bit of additional charge should the battery run out. And finally, we have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, or FCEVs. Um, these are perhaps slightly rarer, um, but these essentially are powered by a hydrogen fuel cell, which combines hydrogen and oxygen to create energy or electricity and H2O or water, which is the only emission. So when we're talking about electric vehicles or EVs throughout this webinar, these are the main categories we're recovering. It may encompass all of them or certain ones throughout. Um, and as you can see at the bottom there, Electric vehicles isn't limited to four-wheel cars. You can obviously have, you know, have scooters or forklift trucks within your forklift truck, forklift trucks within your organisation, which are wholly electric powered as well and can be charged on site. 
So just to give a little bit about the, I suppose, the, the market trends in the UK we've seen recently, um, as I'm sure you, you are well aware, the number of EVs in the UK are increasing significantly. Uh, as you can see at the top point here, uh, in August 2018, there were 166,000 EVs registered in the UK. And this is a, a huge leap from just 3,500 only five years ago. Um, the growth is really quite almost exponential. And in 2018, I think it was around 4% of new vehicles were alternate, alternate drivetrain vehicles. While this is still you know, not a huge amount of the overall market, is it, again, as I say, significant growth from where we were only a few years ago. Uh, the graph here on the right just gives you a list of uh, the most popular vehicles, uh, best-selling plug-in models of 2018. Uh, you can see the most popular model was the Nissan Leaf, which is a small, pure EV car. Um, and then the following six models were all hybrid vehicles. So you can see there's still quite a trend of uh, people choosing hybrids over fully electric vehicles. Um, and there's maybe a couple of reasons for this, which we'll discuss later on. But also what's quite obvious is that there are plenty of different models available there and plenty of mainstream manufacturers are you know, producing EVs for consumer and business use. Um, coincidentally, as of today, I think the UK is also hosting the world's first zero emission vehicle summit up in Birmingham. And this is you know, really to show leadership in the area as a, as a nation and to show the government's commitment to building the EV market within the UK. So why exactly are EVs growing so much? There's a number of reasons which are leading towards this growth. Um, but starting with the graph, I think the, the obvious trend you can see there is the significant drop off in new diesel vehicles in the last couple of years. Uh, this is for two main reasons. The first being the emission scandal of a couple of years ago with VW. Um, there's general distrust for, I guess, manufacturers' ratings of diesel and perhaps the you know, emissions weren't, you know, businesses weren't seeing the emissions savings they're hoping for. Um, and then also the government has committed to phase out new diesel vehicles by 2040. Obviously, this is quite a significant step. And as a result, a lot of businesses and people are already choosing to opt away from diesel. At the bottom of the graph there, you can see that alternative fuels are growing quite significantly over the last four years. Um, and this is also uh, helped by the government committing to further grants available for plug-in cars and EVs. We will discuss the, the grants and financing options available later on in this webinar as the government has committed to providing these until at least 2020. And finally, the last point is that, as mentioned, plenty of the mainstream manufacturers have committed to investing in their own technology research and providing you know, new accessible EVs to the market and also supporting the surrounding infrastructure to obviously charge of vehicles. Quickly, just to touch on a point about diesel regulation in the UK. Uh, one of the main issues for the UK government when it comes to encouraging use of EVs and shifting away from diesel is not actually carbon emissions, but more air quality issues. This map here is a map of London uh, showing the level of NO2 concentration within London. And as you can imagine, in big cities such as London, elsewhere across the country, uh, the amount of diesel fumes in the atmosphere is actually reaching quite dangerous levels. So, as I mentioned, the UK government has committed to stop the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles by 2040. Um, hybrids are not included in this ban, uh, but the, ship, the aim is really to shift everyone towards alternative fuel vehicles. Local authorities have also been given the power to implement their own clean air zones if they wish. Um, it's a 220 million clean air fund and this is actually funded by the increase in tax on diesel cars. Um, so this gives local authorities a chance to perhaps yeah, introduce their own congestion charge type zone. To touch on charging infrastructure, um, obviously charging is a huge part of uptake of EVs. If, you know, petrol stations are across the country, whereas charging stations are actually um, much harder to find and there's still, still some anxiety around you know will I have enough charge to reach my destination. Um, the graph here is from ZapMap which is a up-to-date list of all, all the available charge, public charging points so it doesn't include any potential home charging points um, and you can you know, go to your location you can filter it and see can kind of route around the charging points. 
the number of charging points is growing significantly. Um, as I said, there's you know, home and workplace and public charging points available. Um, there's been some, it's not perhaps confusion, but some difficulties in getting manufacturers to agree on a standard charging type, but the UK government has now recently passed the Autonomous and Electric Vehicles Act, which has set some rules and requirements for providers of charging equipment. This, you know, this mandates that uh, motorway service stations and large petrol stations will have to provide charging facilities, and also it will aim to standardise the charging plug between different manufacturers so that you can pull up to any public charging station and be able to charge a vehicle. Uh, the final point there is that it's often left to, left to local authorities to actually install for public charge points. Um, so a lot of work needs to be done for local authorities to engage with drivers and businesses to understand where the best place to install these charges are. Um, the charging infrastructure, as I said, is growing rapidly, um, but there still are some areas which are not as well served as others, as you can see on the map. So hopefully that was just a bit of a kind of a useful introduction to why electric vehicles are growing so rapidly in the UK, um, you know, um, and a bit about kind of the technology behind it and what we mean throughout the rest of this presentation. So now I just want to discuss whether electric vehicles are actually suitable for your business. Um, because obviously a lot of companies may like to you know, switch to electric vehicles, um, but in some cases may not actually be appropriate for the business. And there are still some questions you will need to ask yourself and establish about your own your own vehicle fleet. So I've just listed here a couple of options. This, this is not it's not an exhaustive list. There are plenty of other ways you could integrate electric vehicles into your existing fleet. Um, and it may be the case that you don't have a fleet at all at the moment. Um, but, you know, and just to kind of clarify, when I talk about your fleet, this can be company cars, this can be commercial vehicles such as vans, but it can also be um, employees driving their own cars and then claiming mileage. All of this is encompassed within your fleet um, when I mention it throughout this webinar. So what options are available? Um, you can offer staff an EV as a company car for personal business travel. This is quite a, obviously quite a common solution, it's just replacing the existing fleet and offering staff an electric alternative. You can also utilize electric vehicles within a commercial fleet. We've seen quite a lot of this recently um, with companies opting to replace smaller vans with electric vans. Um, also you know, here in London, we've seen that a lot of the iconic black cabs are being replaced with electric versions now. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this again, which we'll touch on in this webinar. Uh, you can also provide a pool car for employees, so have charging facilities on site with you know, a small number of cars available, which are always, always there and then available to staff to take out for shorter journeys and return to the place of work with, throughout the day. And finally, also the business may choose to just provide on-site charging facilities for staff to drive their own cars or perhaps for public use as well um, without going ahead and actually replacing any of their fleet. But as I said, there's you know, plenty of other ways that electric vehicles can be integrated into your fleet. So going to the first point, um, when would it be suitable to choose electric vehicles as a replacement for your existing company cars? So initially, let's talk about a couple of the advantages of electric vehicles over traditional fuel vehicles. Obviously, the most significant and probably most impactful one for your business will be the significantly lower cost per mile um, of an electric vehicle compared to a traditionally fueled vehicle. Um, so electric vehicles are approximately about 4 pence per mile, and this is compared to 8p to 10p for traditional fueled vehicles. Uh, the government has just released some figures on the advisory fuel rates for reimbursing electric vehicle mileage, and they have um, valued that mileage at 4p per mile. There of course also zero tailpipe emissions and this has benefits for both the overall emissions associated with your business and also lead to higher air quality, you know, lower and uh, lower noise pollution as well. So when would this be suitable? What vehicles I suppose or what operations are best suited to replacing traditional fuel vehicles with electric vehicles? Um, best suited for drivers that cover a high number of annual miles but in the region of around 80 to 150 miles per day so frequent mileage but perhaps maybe shorter journeys the reason for this being of course kind of the, the range of evs there's still some range anxiety um, and that is why a number of businesses are still perhaps hesitant to switch to evs 
uh, and you know, people don't want to get stuck away from a charging station, but the, the range on VVs is increasing significantly with every every model, which has increased you know, a couple of years ago, but about 100 miles, I believe, uh, the maximum but now there's big with being released by the kind of key players, BMW and Nissan, with ranges of up to 250 miles, which should ease some of the anxiety around range. As, as I said here, you can see that um, a high number of annual miles but short distances can make pool cars very attractive financially. The reason for this being that it may be you know, shorter journeys but being used throughout the day by different drivers and they're able to return to a place of work, charge a vehicle when not in use, ready for the next employee to hop in the car and carry out a, a small journey. Um, it's also worth noting that electric vehicles are exempt from the congestion charge, so any businesses with employees driving into London regularly um, will see significant savings from not having to pay a congestion charge. As you've already touched on, um, I suppose the, the main barrier is the daily journey distance and the availability of charging points. Um, if employees are carrying out a lot of motorway driving, this may not be suitable for electric vehicles. Um, I've added a graph here from the Energy Saving Trust just to kind of give an example of the impact of the different types of driving and how that affects the, the range available. So the, the pink line at the top, that is typical urban driving around cities. And you can see here that's achieving a range of around 95 miles. However, if you were to primarily carry out motorway driving, this is more intensive on the battery, so you see that range dropping you know, almost 50% to 60 miles. So it's important to consider you know, different types of journeys that are being carried out within the vehicles and how this will actually impact the range. Moving on to discussing introducing electric vehicles as a placement for commercial vehicles. So as I said, this could be replacing a fleet of vans, could be heavy goods vehicles up to a certain limit, um, could be perhaps as scooters, but choosing to replace yeah, your commercial vehicles with electric vehicle alternatives. So again, the advantages, uh, cost per mile is significantly lower than fuel alternatives, and this is especially well suited to urban driving and last mile delivery, where you know, predominantly uh, um, city-based driving where there may be congestion charges, there may be other charges to consider. Um, and as you can see here, the exemptions from the clean air zones charges and also lower noise pollution and higher air quality. This also ensures that you kind of mitigate some risk when it comes to cities opting to in, implement their own clean air zones in other cities throughout the UK, not just London. So when would this be suitable? Um, this is for vans or commercial vehicles that carry out a lot of urban driving from a central distribution point where it would be possible to install a charger so that you can charge vehicles perhaps overnight or when not in use and then use them to carry out you know, urban driving, perhaps home delivery, etc. or uh, you know, maybe utility vans going from house to house um, around urban driving. Currently, electric vehicles probably aren't well suited for you know, the heavy larger end of a heavy goods vehicles, so perhaps three and a half tons and upwards. There are some electric vehicles available, but this technology is still being developed. And also vehicles covering significant rural distances where the availability of public charging may be slightly more limited. On the topic of vehicle weight, this graph here just gives some indication of the range and how range changes as you increase the payload on board vehicle. So this is where the axis actually swapped from the last graph, so now range is on the left-hand side as opposed to along the bottom. But you can see that the overall rated range of the vehicle decreases quite significantly, again, around yeah, up to 50% when you increase the payload from zero kilograms to 700 kilograms. So this is very useful to consider when you know, thinking about if you have a fleet of commercial vehicles that are carrying around perhaps tools or other equipment throughout the day, if there is a lot of, if you're just carrying around a lot of items that you know maybe aren't needed day to day, uh, you are effectively limiting the range of a vehicle. So having kind of evaluated when it's suitable to replace a traditional vehicle with a electric vehicle alternative, here's just a, a list of questions which could be useful if you, you know, want to audit your own fleet or think about uh, how best to implement an electric vehicle fleet into your own business. So quickly just to run through these, it's, you know, it's worth asking, you know, how many miles do my staff cover per day or per year? 
so you can establish whether that fits into that sweet spot of around 82 150 miles per day you can also think about whether it'd be better to lease the vehicles or purchase them outright for the business uh, very importantly it's worth considering whether the site has adequate load capacity for charging installing charges can have quite a significant impact on the amount of electricity consumed on site so this is something that you'd need to investigate beforehand before going ahead and installing charges on site um, on that it's also worth considering what kind of electricity you're purchasing obviously electric vehicles have zero emissions from the tailpipe however there are still carbon emissions associated with the electricity used, um, used to charge these vehicles. If you're on a green tariff, these emissions will be lower, but if you perhaps you're just receiving standard grid energy, you know, there will be emissions from the electricity provided. And then, of course, you need to consider the financial side of it and ask what's the current annual fuel bill, and this also can include expense mileage, and then you can use this information to evaluate whether it would be beneficial financially to switch to electric vehicles over traditional fuel vehicles. On that, I now want to provide a few examples. Uh, we have a range of different vehicles available. I've selected kind of a handful of some of the more popular models to demonstrate how you can go about presenting a business case, perhaps to upper management or finance on how to implement electric vehicles into fleet and show where those savings will be realised. So on this chart here, I appreciate there's a fair fair number of numbers and figures on within this table. Um, I'll try and draw out some of the key ones. Uh, essentially, I provide here on the left a Ford Focus, which is uh, one of the more typical company's cars. And this particular model here is actually one of the more efficient company cars available. Um, and then compared the running costs of this over three years, assuming 20,000 miles per year, with four EV alternatives, just to try and demonstrate where you'll be seeing savings and to compare, you know, the overall life cycle costs of owning or operating an electric vehicle. So, going down the road, you can see that the top row gives the OTR or P11K value of the, of the vehicle. Um, then also we have the emissions associated with that particular vehicle. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Focus, the 88 grams is actually one of the more efficient company cars available. But of course, electric vehicles moving along to the right, you can see have zero tailpipe emissions with the exception of the Mitsubishi Outlander uh, plug-in hybrid vehicle, which has some emissions as it does have an internal combustion engine on board. The next row along shows the average fuel cost per mile. Again, I think it's important to highlight that while the Ford Focus is still a very efficient vehicle, the pence per mile of the other models, with the exception of the plug-in hybrid, is just over half, half the fuel cost of Ford Focus. Using this figure and the you know, assumed 60,000 mile cycle, you can then establish the total fuel cost associated with running these vehicles. When you then consider the depreciation and maintenance of these vehicles over a three-year period, you then are able to pull up a total life cycle cost, which is that row, which is third from the bottom. So using an example of the Ford Focus, this would cost you just under £21,000 over three years. And then you can clearly see going along the line, operating either Renault Zoe or um, Nissan Leaf would save you between two and two and a half thousand pounds compared to running a typical fuel vehicle. The plug-in hybrid would, in fact, be more expensive to run than Ford Focus, for the reason this being it is a, just, a, as you can see, a far more expensive vehicle and still does have quite significant fuel costs. Um, however, for the, I suppose, the size of the vehicle, it's still a reasonable value. And then also at the end here, we've also included a typical, one of the more popular uh, electric vehicle vans, uh, the Nissan ENV200 uh, as centre. And again, you can see here, the running costs are very low per mile and the total life cycle cost is quite reasonable, £22,230. I've also included the overall tailpipe emissions with each of these vehicles and a range on full charge to give you some idea of both the environmental and you know, operational capabilities of these vehicles. So it, well, yeah, if you want to go use this information to present the business case, I think that total life cycle cost uh, line is the uh, 
the key piece of information there shows that the savings are in the region of yeah, two to two and a half thousand pounds in this particular example, and that's compared to one of the most efficient company cars on the market for Ford Focus. If your fleet is operating perhaps larger vehicles such as uh, Ford Mondeos or VW Passats, that will have a higher cost per mile, but less efficient and are more expensive. So the overall life cycle costs will be, or well, the savings will be greater. This also doesn't consider perhaps any journeys into congestion charge, which again, the electric vehicles are exempt from. So there'll be further savings realized there. So I'd encourage you to use this information and perhaps yeah, carry out your own comparison of your own existing vehicles and you know, with perhaps the lease cycle and the mile cycle suited to your business and you know, establish where those life cycle savings can be found. As well as the savings for business, it's also important to communicate the benefits to the employees uh, as there are you know, tax and monetary savings for employees. Um, if employees are using electric vehicles as company cars, then there's, as I said, lower, lower tax on that as it's a benefit. Um, and also the cost of private fuel to them will be significantly lower. Um, again, I've just used Ford Focus here and a Nissan Leaf just to show the difference in life cycle costs. Uh, this example is actually over four years, um, but this is in the region of about £2,100 savings for employees, completely independent of the business as well. And this can be very useful when communicating to employees the benefits to them of the company switching to electric vehicles as well. So now we've established that uh, yeah, there, there is a, a legitimate business case for moving to electric vehicles over fuel vehicles, I want to provide some information on you know, what grant funding and what financial support is available to companies or individuals wishing to switch from traditional fuel vehicles over to electric vehicles. There's four main financial incentives available. Local authorities or individual manufacturers may have their own schemes and I'd encourage you to check with them as well. Um, but these are the nationwide support available through the UK government. The first is the workplace charging screen scheme. This is grant funding of 75% of the cost of a single workplace charging station and you can apply for up to 20 stations. Uh, I believe this is capped at £500 per station, um, but can give you significant savings if you install a large number of charging stations. And perhaps the most, uh, the, most the highest, largest grant available is also the plug-in grant scheme. So this is available for both businesses and individuals, uh, but the government provides a grant for the purchase of new electric vehicles uh, that costs less than £60,000 by of, you know, a grant of 35% up to a maximum of £2,500 for hybrids or up to £4,500 for full electric vehicles. As I said earlier in the presentation, um, this, this scheme has been committed to run to at least 2020 and has received further funding from the government to encourage it. It's worth noting that in both of this scheme and the uh, scheme above, the provider of the service applies for the grant and the person purchasing a vehicle does not have to apply for a grant themselves. The third grant available is the electric vehicle home charge scheme. This is very similar to the workplace charging scheme at the top, um, but applies to people applying for charging stations within the home home. Maybe the case that if an employee receives an electric vehicle company car, they may, may wish to charge their own home charging station. So again, you get 75% of the cost of the domestic charge point up to 500 pounds. And finally, um, as we've already mentioned, there are some tax exemptions available for electric vehicles. So vehicles under 40,000 pounds are exempt from any vehicle exercise duty. And the majority of electric vehicles are exempt from the congestion charge in London and any potential future clean air zone charges that will arise. So as you see, the government has committed to helping people switch from uh, traditionally fueled vehicles to electric vehicles. As well as just the cost side, I think it's also important to consider some of the other business considerations. Um, on the left here, we have, I suppose, the, the drivers and pros to switching to electric vehicles. And then on the right, perhaps some barriers that are worth thinking about for your own individual business. So of course, the other business considerations um, are that there are significantly lower carbon emissions from your fleet. So if you 
are looking, thinking about reporting your carbon emissions of your overall operation. Uh, your fleet should, of course, be included within your carbon emissions. So switching to electric vehicles allows you to report lower carbon emissions. As I mentioned earlier, it's not a case of reporting zero carbon emissions, as there is still the emissions associated with the electricity used to charge vehicles. But this can also, you know, of course, provide uh, the basis of comms or perhaps marketing material demonstrating the CSR credentials of your business. As I mentioned already, it also mitigates future risk from any clean air zones or other air quality regulation by switching to electric vehicles and away from traditional fuels such as diesel uh, that future proofs the business. Uh, one, one area which is often actually overlooked but electric engines have typically much fewer moving parts than a traditional combustion engine. Um, for example, there's no you know, oil or air filters required. This means that the maintenance costs are typically lower and uh, lower risk of vehicles breaking down. There's lower noise pollution. This can be especially important for people operating commercial fleets in residential areas. Um, and the fifth point is perhaps a bit subjective, but it's a typically better driving experience as the acceleration is smoother and typically easier to drive than a traditional fuel vehicle. And finally, the last point is it reduces reliance on imported fuel prices. As you've seen in the past few years, it can be quite a volatile cost of petrol or diesel at the petrol station um, and switching to electric reduces your reliance as a business on the price of fuel being imported from other countries. In terms of what barriers to consider, we've also said that on-site charging may require additional load management. Um, so this is something you will need to investigate and make sure that your site has a capacity for charging vehicles. Uh, you may also need to provide some level of driver training for operating new vehicles and using these and charging these most efficiently. And then the third, we've, we've learned from talking to a few of our customers here at Carbon Trust as well, staff may push back to you know, operational changes, whether it be changing commercial vehicles or being told to switch their company car. So this is where you need to engage with your staff and work out what is most important for them, how they use the vehicles and also explain to them some of the benefits that we've already covered within this webinar. So the, now I've just provided a couple of case studies um, to actually demonstrate real world implementation of electric vehicles, uh, just to demonstrate that you know a lot of these advantages that I'm talking about are actually being implemented by businesses already and they are seeing some other returns, be it yeah, financial or environmental. So this first study here, um, available at go, go ultra low .com, um is a demonstration of Nottingham City Council. Uh, I think it's quite a useful case study to show because being a public body, you can imagine that uh, cost and cost efficiency is an incredibly important part of the business so that use funds um, as optimally as possible. Um, and so by switching to electric vehicles, you know, they've been able to see significant operational cost reductions and fuel cost reductions. So they have 25 plug-in vehicles in the fleet, as you can see in the pictures here. Uh, they have small cars, these are Nissan Leafs, and also the Nissan ENV 200 vans that we've also mentioned earlier. Uh, they're planning to upgrade to 80 overall by 2020, so you can see that they have seen you know, significant business case in here. Uh, they have estimated that the cost savings on their van fleet since switching to electric has been almost 70%, which is as you can see, a significant number. Um, the point on the, in 2010, they began their EV fleet with just two vehicles. And I think that's quite important to highlight that a lot of the time it may not be suitable to make a significant switch from your existing fleet and replace a large number of vehicles all at once. Um, and often it is appropriate to perhaps have a slightly more staggered transition to ensure that you have, as I already said, the charging capabilities on site and there's not too uh, two disruptive operational changes. Um, but final point, well, second final point says that they yeah. aiming to increase the life cycle of their fleet vehicles to 10 years, and a big part of this is the lower service and maintenance and repair costs of the plug-in vehicles, which I touched on before. So as you can see, they have had significant success employing the two different types of electric vehicle and have seen significant savings within their fleet. Um, another example, <clears throat> Excuse me. Another example I've included here um, is just a recent commitment from two, uh, two of the largest uh, fleet operators in the UK, Tesco and Network Rail, 
um, they have committed to fully electrify their van fleet. So this is approximately 18,000 vehicles, so a very significant number. And really is just a testament to uh, you know, a large companies seeing the business case for switching to EVs and mitigating you know, future risk. Uh, as you can see in the, in the screenshot, they have committed to do this by 2028, so it is quite a, a long-term project, uh, but the main reason for this being it is a significant number of vehicles. Uh, I've also mentioned that there's a scheme called EV100, um, where a number of companies have uh, committed to electrifying their fleet or their supply chain, um, and that website details some of those commitments if you'd like to find some additional operation um, and additional examples. So that's really the main bulk of the webinar on talking a bit about where electric vehicles are suitable for your business and presenting the business case for electric vehicles and giving you some examples. And now I just want to talk a little bit about how the Green Business Fund can support the move to electric vehicles. So for those who are perhaps not too familiar with the Green Business Fund, the Green Business Fund is a scheme that has been operated by the Carbon Trust for around two years now. Uh, this is uh, basically have a pot of funding available to provide a number of different energy efficiency services for SMEs throughout the UK. Um, these are workshops, uh, funded energy audits, uh, implementation advice and a, a pot of funding as well to provide grants and capital contribution for qualifying projects. All of these services are free of charge to SMEs and are provided to help we support the carbon trust mission as a way of moving to a sustainable low carbon economy. Um, for EVs uh, in particular, I think it's worth noting that uh, although there is funding available, um, electric vehicles and charging points are do not qualify for the funding. Um, however, as I will talk through here, there are a number of other services that may be relevant to your business and to help you, you know, perhaps understand the best way to implement electric vehicles into your fleet. So the first of these services is energy efficiency training. Uh, we host a number of workshops across the country. Uh, these are two hour workshops delivered by one of our experts in energy efficiency, and they're aimed at helping you understand your energy consumption and begin to identify uh, low cost measures to improving your energy efficiency. Uh, we have a couple of upcoming workshop workshops coming up. We have Herefordshire on the 10th of October and Chippenham on the 19th of October. And if you're interested in these, I encourage you to register your interest on the Carbon Trust website. As well as workshops, we also have opportunity assessments, which are basically free energy audits for your business. Uh, these are delivered by one of the Carbon Trust's engineers, and they will carry out either an on-site or remote audit of your business and identify the top three energy saving recommendations and give you the next steps needed to go ahead and realize these savings. Uh, it may well be the case that you would like to apply for this service and have them look at your perhaps your existing fleet or identify the best way to incorporate a low emission fleet into your business. We also have implementation advice. This is almost a follow up to the opportunity assessments. Uh, the implementation advice is to help companies who have identified uh, a project they want to go ahead with and one of our uh, consultants can help you uh, perhaps develop a tender document, go out to suitable companies and evaluate what would be the best option for your business. And then finally, as I mentioned, there are grants and capital contributions available through the Green Business Fund. Uh, this is 15% towards the total cost of energy saving equipment. Uh, there is an upper limit of £5,000 and a lower project limit of well, lower contribution limit of £750 and the project should see a payback within five years. Uh, qualifying qualifying projects uh, can be found through our Green Business Directory um, and if you want to apply for this, you should apply via the Carbon Trust website and one of our experts will be able to talk you through the process and establish whether your energy saving project is um, will qualify for a grant. As I mentioned, if you wish to install uh, charging points or install electric vehicles into your fleet, um, unfortunately, this doesn't um, qualify for this particular funding as this funding is aimed at the installation of new energy efficient equipment. 
as I mentioned just there, the Green Business Directory is a list of suppliers of energy efficient equipment who have been independently assessed and verified by ourselves here at the Carbon Trust. Uh, the list can be found on our website and also the directory does include uh, providers of um, electric vehicle charges as well, should that be something that you wish to investigate for your business now. So I think that just about wraps up the um, webinar um, and I just want to leave a few kind of concluding points. Um, so as, as you discussed and shown that you know, the growth of EVs has expanded rapidly in the UK, uh, there is you know, significant uh, legislation and you know, commercial forces pushing the, pushing the growth of EVs in the country. Uh, there are both multiple business and environmental benefits to switching to EVs within your fleet. Um, We've discussed some of these and it may well be the case that you know, maybe not all operations are suitable for switching to EVs, but there may be some parts of the business where you will be able to uh, realise uh, actual cost savings by replacing traditional fuel vehicles with electric alternatives, as well as seeing the environmental benefits of doing this as well. Uh, if you have any, we will have now some time for some questions, but if you do have any further questions or want to get in one touch with one of our experts uh, one to one, then I'd encourage you to call the Carbon Trust or alternatively contact myself. Uh, my email details will be provided uh, after the webinar, along with a copy of the slides and the link to um, listen back to the webinar. So I think now we will open floor to QA and perhaps over the next, the next 15 20 minutes, hopefully, address any questions that people may have. Have had any, any questions come through? We're just going to briefly mute the microphone just so we can um, gather all the questions that are coming in. So feel free to um, ask any question that you like and we'll be selecting some for Jamie to answer. Okay, we've had a number of questions come through, so I'd like to just address some of these now. Um, the first question is, is the incentive scheme by the government for electric vehicles also valid for trucks or commercial vehicles, or only some specific electric vehicles? Uh, that's a good question, um, and the answer is yes, it is only for a number of specific electric vehicles. Uh, you can find out which vehicles are available for funding directly through the government's website. If you go to GovUK and look for the plug-in and car or van grants eligibility criteria, they do provide a list of all the current vehicles that are available for the different levels of funding. In regards to the um, vans or trucks available, um, there are a number of vans available. So we have looked already the Nissan, the ENV200, that's, that's eligible, um, you know, perhaps a other Peugeots or Renault electric vans as well. Um, and the, I think the requirement is that these vehicles have to have overall tailpipe emissions of less than 75 grams per kilometre and can travel at least 10 miles without any emissions at all, so on a purely electric engine. So I don't think there's, there may not be any, maybe perhaps three and a half tonne um, or larger commercial vehicles available for funding. But there is a list of vans available which do qualify for a grant funding. Um, and then similarly, we've also had a question on whether there's any refrigerated vans being used currently. Um, I must admit off the top of my head, I don't know if any of the vans on that list of um, eligible vehicles are refrigerated. Um, but I think from talking to and seeing a couple of other examples, uh, there are perhaps fleets such as 
Tesco's or Ocado or uh, are operating hybrid vehicles. I don't, I don't know if that is the case or not, but I believe so. Um, however, that's something that you perhaps need to uh, investigate. And there may be options for retrofitting or adapting existing vans to have refrigeration systems on board, which can be perhaps charged by an electric engine or charged by an onboard generator and some hybrid between the two. So I'm afraid I don't have a explicit answer for that question. Uh, we've got a, another question asking whether it's possible to get a grant from a carbon trust if applying for receiving a government grant as well. Um, I believe that is the case. You are able to combine um, the capital of capital contribution from Green Business Fund uh, with any other grant as well. However, as I mentioned, that um, electric vehicles do not qualify for the Car and Trust Green Business Fund capital contribution. Um, so that would have to be exclusively reserved for replacing energy efficient equipment. Uh, we have another question here asking where companies have installed a small number of charge points is a standard set of rules for employees using them. Um, no, this is very much up to uh, the company to decide what is you know, best for uh, best for both the company and for employees. Uh, may well be the case that, as mentioned already, um, it is important to consider the capacity um, of your site and whether your site does have load capacity for charging you know, perhaps 24-7 or a large number of vehicles. Uh, so that's really for yourself to investigate and um, using that as a basis to then establish some rules and some regulations with your own employees for using those. Um, there is some best practice on charging uh, you know, uh, in terms of leaving it plugged in and also it's worth considering that there is an ongoing conversation at the moment between utilities um, of how to manage the increase in, I guess, increase in load on the national grid. Uh, for example, when employees or people get home around five, six o'clock and all get home at the same time and all plug in their electric vehicles at the same time. Obviously, this will increase the demand on the grid. So there is some discussion on perhaps smart grid charging where uh, the charge will only charge a vehicle at low peak hours um, or off peak hours. However, this isn't in place yet and would not probably apply to your business yet, but it is worth considering that uh, there may be certain hours of the day which are more cost effective to charge vehicles than other in the near future. Uh, and we have a final question here. If anyone does have some other questions, please feel free to send them through. But one question saying, can you send out copies of the slides, please? And um, I believe both the webinar will be available on YouTube and a download link will be sent out afterwards with a link to the slides where you'll be able to download these and um, use them as you wish. So that's all the current questions we have. Um, I'd encourage anyone else if they do have any, any final questions to send them in now. Uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes to do this. Excellent, we've got um, another final question. How long is the process once you start? Um, sorry, Dean, could you just um, clarify, do you mean is that for the process of switching to electric vehicles or the process of applying for a grant or? Um, process of the grant. So as I mentioned, um, the grant is actually um, available to the suppliers of the vehicles. So if you choose to go ahead and replace some of the vehicles, you may have a leasing partner. Um, if and if, if a leasing partner provides you with new vehicles, they will already discount the, the cost from the grant off the price that you pay and then they apply for the, the grant themselves as the provider of the vehicles. Um, they, yeah, they apply to the government directly for the funding. So in theory, there should be very little for you to do as the as a purchaser, uh, this applies to leasing partners or buying vehicles directly at uh, any dealership. Um, all you do is mention that obviously you'd like to benefit from the plug-in grant and then it's on the provider of the vehicles to um, apply themselves for 
the money from the government. And on that, it's also worth noting that both leasing and purchasing vehicles outright, as long as they are new vehicles, you are able to benefit from the grant and um, receive, uh, well, yeah, receive the benefits of that and pay less for for the vehicles. Great, and I think we have no more questions coming through. Um, so I think probably a good time to end the webinar there. Um, thank you very much everyone for tuning in this morning and listening. Um, as I said, these slides will be available both on YouTube and will be sent out and you can contact either one of my colleagues at the Carbon Trust or contact myself directly if you have any further questions and we'd be happy to help out. Thank you very much. <laughs>